is Christmas with Olin Krutz. And I got to tell you, this is his season. And you called it yesterday, Olin. You thought that uh, Justin Fields had played well traditionally against Detroit. And lo and behold, he did so again. And, uh, you know, I, I, I said to David this morning, a very interesting game in terms of trying to figure out what Detroit is because – I just don't see them going on the road and winning a playoff game, and it looks like they're going on the road to play a playoff game. Good morning, Olin. How are you? Good morning, guys. How's it going? Good. We're, we're fired up because uh, yeah, you know there's a there's a chance here now, and I think we've seen improvement, and everybody, uh, all the callers are very excited. Yeah, we're on a three week run. That's the first time in a while, right? Three weeks of uh, you know with the bye week, we won a game. Bye week, win another game. Uh, you don't got to go to the gas station or to like my daughter's basketball games or anywhere and hear about what the hell are the Bears doing. So <laughs> uh, good job by the Chicago Bears. Good win yesterday. Going into the game, Molly, like we talked, um, I had them winning by 10 points. I-, I thought they were the better football team for the first time in a long time. And that changes a lot for the Chicago Bears. As, as you guys know, uh, we've been covering them now the last two years. Just to think that they're better by that much going into the game tells you that the Chicago Bears are improving as a football team. And, and, and when I came to that conclusion, just going over the rosters and watching video of the Lions play before, and obviously the Chicago Bears, when they played the Lions, right, going into the game, they were averaging 200 yards rushing against the uh, Detroit Lions the last three times they played them. And their only problem really was the defense was giving up about 30 points a game uh, against the Detroit Lions. So you knew the defense would play better. Uh, you knew at home uh, they would have an advantage. You knew the Lions were without their all-pro center. All those things you thought going to the game. Look, that the Chicago Bears should win this football game. Now, can they execute? Can they be the team that is actually the better team? And they were yesterday. Olin, when people talk to you about the Bears and they ask you, okay, it looks like that defense is different or better or even one to be feared with the addition of Montez Sweat. And I think the tape and the numbers suggest that is true. How do you explain to them what it is about Montez Sweat that one guy can make an entire defense that much better? Well, they had all the other pieces, right, David? They, you, you were saying watching them play before, man, that back seven, if they ever are all there healthy together, they have a chance to be really good, right? Brisker, Gordon. Remember, Gr- Gordon was hurt for a while, yeah. right? Tyreek Stevenson was out. Uh, Jalen Johnson was out, I think, also. Brisker had, was bumped up. Uh, Tremaine Edmonds got injured. T.J. Edwards is playing good football, but you knew when they were all there, man, this team has a, this unit, this back seven, which they put a lot of assets into, right? A lot of second-round picks back there, a lot of money at the linebacker position, and then all of a sudden you're watching this guy, Andrew Billings, patrol the middle and dominate against the run game. Justin Jones playing good, Walker playing good against the run. You thought, man, if they could just get to the quarterback on third down, because quarterbacks, you guys remember watching games before thinking, man, how long is that guy sitting in the pocket going through his progressions and nobody's getting near him? And then all of a sudden, and then they got Montez Sweat and they added that one piece. As you guys know, man, uh, Montez Sweat, very, very good football player, fun to watch. He has raised the level of this defense, but he is not doing it by himself, right? He is, his, his piece added to a lot of good football players has completed the defense and Coach Eberflus taking over the play calling. I thought yesterday his chess match in the second half against Ben Johnson. He knew Ben Johnson wouldn't be patient. He knew he wouldn't stick with the run. He outguessed him a lot in that second half. And with those pieces he has on his chessboard, you saw a dominating performance. Yeah, it, it was um, the kind of uh, performance that, that keeps your job. I mean, it was, you know, there we have a lot of questions about what they're going to end up doing and how they're going to go about it and, you know, when we talked to Dan Pompey, he, he made the observation that usually when you get to a, a, a season like this and you, you know, listen, we know they're they're five and four and that's all that matters, but they did start 0 and 4. And, and that would mean there would be some sort of correction within the, the building, especially with what's happened with the coaching staff, et cetera. Um, it just seemed like a, a, a climb upward and... Eberflus has kept the team together. They're improving as a defense. They've gotten better since they're letting Fields kind of do the things he likes to do. It just feels like a different point 
in the administration than it was, I don't know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Yeah, and if we're talking about the view from the top and not just yesterday's game, right, not just these three weeks with two games against the Detroit Lions, who are the division-leading Detroit Lions, but the Chicago Bears have three out of their last four games played really good against them, except for last year at the end of the year, I think when the score was 41-10, to 10, but still Justin Fields is averaging over 120 yards rushing the game against these Detroit Lions. So these Bears have played good against them. Talk about the view from the top, Mully. I got to see them these last four games. I got to see them against different teams, right? Uh, the Minnesota Vikings just won a game 3-0, to zero, right? We beat them 12-10. to 10. This is kind of Minnesota Vikings just bench dobs. So I got to look at the whole picture. I don't want to take – you don't want to get too much into it after they just – Beat the Detroit Lions at home, two two wins, two division opponents. Great win yesterday. But if you're talking about what the decision makers are looking at, if you're talking about decisions at the end of the year, you got to see way more of what you saw yesterday against other teams. Good point. I think you don't have to make a decision until you have to make a decision. And that is why I think what happened yesterday also was important to Justin Fields because it, it didn't. We don't have to form any conclusions. He kept the conversation, the controversy, however you want to look at it, Olin, going with another consistent effort. Three in a row now, acceptable games. He had some issues yesterday, obviously, but I think he was dynamic. He, it was a Lamar Jackson type of a day. Where are you with Justin Fields? Is it the same kind of logic you apply to Justin Fields that you just described in, in applying to Matt Eberflus? Yeah, he, he played sometimes, David. The hardest thing to do, is play the way you're supposed to play against a, a team that is coming out. And we heard Dan Campbell all week saying, we got to stop Justin Fields. He is dynamic. And, and you know why? He was averaging over 120 yards rushing against them, right? He's given them a ton of problems. And he gave them a ton of problems again in the first half. Uh, the Lions really struggled, man, on critical downs against Justin Fields. You guys remember the second drive of the game, I think it was 3rd and 8. The Bears are backed up and they, they take a snap. He drops back. He's in the end zone. And he makes two or three guys miss, and he takes off running. I think it was almost a 20 or 30-yard gain on that play. So he's given them a lot of problems. He did what he I thought he would do against the Lions yesterday, the, the kind of game he's been having against the Detroit Lions. So now, like we talked about, where am I with Justin Fields? Exactly where I was coming into the game. I didn't think, I, I didn't think if he played good, I, that, that would change my opinion on Justin Fields. I thought if he played bad, I would start to wonder, man, he's not even playing good against the teams that he plays good against. But now, again, this is the great thing about the NFL, guys. This is why you love watching the NFL. You have all these good games. Things are going great. you got to go do it against the number one defense in Cleveland. And if I'm Justin Fields and I'm Luke Getze and, and I'm Coach Eberflus, I'm excited for this game, man. I, this is the kind of game I want. I want to go on the road. I want to prove to everybody there's things I can do. If I'm Justin Fields, I'm in uh, uh, the film room this morning hoping that I got the ball in my hands against the number one defense on the road in Cleveland to win the game so I can get on to being the Chicago Bears franchise quarterback. It, you know, obviously, next up is is uh, Cleveland at Cleveland, as you mentioned. And, uh, you know, we know they're coming off a big win against the Jags. They're 8-5 and five on the season. They have a really good defense. This is, as you say, this will be a, like an excellent test. The the the, um, the Browns are three and a half point favorites over the Bears, which uh, you know I don't know. You get three for being at home. I I, I think that's um, that's more about the look ahead line than it is about the Bears' performance. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I can't tell you. I've said a ton about the Cleveland Browns. I know uh, they have, you know, they've they've historically had a good run game uh, since, uh, you know, Bill Callahan, the O-line coach, and Kevin Stefanski, their head coach, have been there. They got right. Jim Schwartz now as their defensive coordinator. Uh, we've seen him at the Lions for years, played against him. He was at the Eagles. We all know the, the edge and the way his defense attacks people. Uh, my first look at them, I thought they had some injuries going into the last, yesterday's game. I'd have to look at them more. But like we talked about, guys, uh, if, you're, if you're Justin Fields, uh, you're already in the film room. You're already past the Detroit Lions. You expected to beat the Detroit Lions yesterday. We expected them to beat the Detroit Lions yesterday. I don't expect that when I look at this film, that when I look at these rosters, that when I match these two teams up, I don't expect that I'm going to take the, the Chicago Bears this week to beat the Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. 
And that's what Justin Fields has to do, guys. He has to change people's minds. Guys like me who don't think that when the ball is in his hands late in the game that he can beat a team like Cleveland, that he can beat a defensive coordinator like Jim Schwartz on the road. I am hoping for Ryan Poles, for Chicago, for all of us, that the ball is in Justin Fields' hand late in the game and he has to win the game and we get to watch him do it. That'd be something. That would be something else, Olin. So take us back to Sunday, 4th and 13. Bears uh, aren't going to run a play. They are on the field. They lined up offensively. From a center's point of view, what's going on in your head? And then when you have the hard count, and clearly Aiden Hutchinson jumped uh, quickly and jumped off sides, you have a free play. What's Lucas Patrick thinking? What's the mindset there? And what is the call in the huddle? Big play by Lucas Patrick, man. And a lot of credit goes to him because the call is usually just a dummy cadence. See if we can pull him off. And it's all on the center, right? Make sure he's past the line before you snap the ball. So that's all on him to start that play. Uh, uh, Lucas Patrick, that's, that's just, you see a guy jump, you snap the ball. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking they had all goal routes on. If you see the ball snap, credit to Coach Eberflus. Talked about finishing. Talked about practicing certain situations. I think that's what he did, guys. Just a total guess. It looked like that to me, that it was just a dummy call, and he snapped the ball, and then DJ Moore takes off and, and runs by the cornerback, and, and Justin Fields got to execute, right? And I, I see the games, guys, and I think I've seen our quarterbacks do this. Where the court, the uh, the center snaps it early, and and the, the guy takes off, and we and we show it, we throw a short pass. Always take a shot in that situation. Uh, it's a free down. So they did it. The Chicago Bears did it. They executed what they had to execute. Uh, a credit goes to Lucas Patrick, Justin Fields, and DJ Moore at that moment for being aware of the situation. Credit to Coach Eberflus and his staff for practicing that situation. And thank you to Hutchinson for jumping off sides. <laughs> This segment with Olin Krutz is sponsored by Plumbers 911 Plumbing Emergency. Call the plumbing professionals available 24 7 at 1 833 Plum 911. And, uh, and Olin, I think that um, we had an interesting conversation at one point where Pat suggested that. Um, that you could keep Justin Fields, and you can keep him. He's still under contract. You can keep him for another year, and then you could draft a quarterback, and then you could make your decision whenever you have to make a decision, whenever you feel compelled to make a decision. And I kind of like that idea because we've seen, you know, the Bears have waited forever to get this position straight. And if you are sitting atop the draft, and it looks like they're going to be for the second year running you know, that the quarterback position is the most important position in the league, and if you have an opportunity to take one, it's hard to imagine avoiding that two years running. And so I don't have a problem with them drafting one, and I wouldn't have a problem if they if they kept fields. I kind of like the idea of just loading up as much as possible given the, the history of the position and the fact that uh, even though it's unconventional, convention doesn't seem to work. No, it doesn't, and it hasn't for, for years in the NFL, right? And everyone talks about this developing quarterback problems. It's not only in Chicago. There's a lot of teams looking for quarterbacks, and everybody keeps doing it the same way. Now, look, um, I think Ryan Pace said he's going to take a quarterback every year, right? But um, I don't know about the number one quarterback, right? The, the number one pick, that's the difference. Uh, usually when guys take a quarterback, he's late in the first, or they keep their starter, they take a quarterback late in the first are in the second, third, fourth rounds, right? And then they develop that guy because there's not a rush to get him on the field. This guy is the number one pick of the NFL draft, right? That would be the different thing. That would be the thing that's outside the box. Drafting a quarterback late in the first, early in the second, and keeping your starting quarterback is not that out of box. Even Mahomes, when he was drafted, they kept Alex Smith for a year, right? And he right. developed under him. So uh, you look through the years, though, and you look at the number one quarterbacks, and, and you know, there's guys that you take that, you know, if you have your guy, I mean, Peyton Manning, I think I think he had, uh, I was talking to a, a quarterback coach the other day, and he said the guy, I think he had 38 interceptions his first day. I mean, would they keep a guy like that? Nowadays is the question he posed to me. Huh. And, and I, I don't know, right? So these guys struggle now early, and everyone's just done with them. So it would be, that would be the outside the box thing. But sometimes when things aren't working, you do have to think outside of the box. And I think, guys, as long as you're honest with both guys, Every day you're telling them exactly what your thoughts are, that they're competing against each other, that the best player will play, and you're keeping things moving in the right direction. Why not? 
Why not give it? A, why not try something new at a position that you have never been successful at developing? Yeah, I'm not crazy about that idea, but there's plenty of time to discuss that. I, I'm curious from your offensive line perspective. Well, you're a quarterback expert. So of course. We don't. Yeah, I, I never said I was a quarterback <laughs> expert. I, I just said I didn't, like either, the, David. I just didn't like the idea. Um, <laughs> so, Panay Sewell, the right tackle for the Lions and the Pro Bowl caliber player, he, on a couple snaps, they moved him when they brought in an extra offensive lineman to the left side, maybe to isolate him on a matchup, maybe to block a guy in a certain play. What did you think about that? Why don't more teams do that? And did it stand out to you yesterday? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great point, and it's something you do against teams that are really good at stopping the run because you've got to unsettle them a little bit, right? You've got to change the gaps on them. By that, I mean a lot of times in – I know for a fact in Coach Eberflu's system because I was going against a love in Coach Marinelli and Coach Ron Rivera for a while that when you move guys over, they call it knock. And that means they have to identify – that alignment has moved over, you have now changed the gaps, and they have to make the guard on that side of the line the center. And they have to knock it over so a linebacker has to recognize it, and then you got to move guys over. And the Lions, David, were doing a lot of that, Abali. They were doing a lot of that yesterday, where they were moving the tight ends around. They were trying to get Billings off the center and moving the three technique, move Justin, Justin Jones to the nose, because Billings is an absolute monster. Now, in a couple of times they did that, it was Javon Dexter, the young D lineman that were in the game, and they were out of their gaps a little bit. And it just unsettled the defense a little bit, especially a guy like Panay Sewell moving around. And now you create a matchup, and all of a sudden you got Panay Sewell, uh, Decker, and you got Jonah Jackson next to each other. That is three guys that a lot of times you would want next to each other uh, blocking people and moving them off the ball. So uh, that is why you do it. Why more teams don't do it, I don't know. Uh, you know, in high school, you can ask J.C. McKee if you ever see him. I coach offensive line for him. We do that a lot. We create we create extra gaps. We put extra linemen on the field, move guys around just because it's hard to line up to. And sometimes we'll put linemen on one side and shift them to the other side mid-cadence and just try to unsettle the defense so we can get running downhill, create ourselves some kind of advantage. That's all you're trying to do with motions on offense. You're trying to create some kind of advantage, but you have to know why you're doing it and you have to know what defensive player you're trying to affect with those motions, those movements, and those kind of formations. Olin, we know that Goff threw a couple picks. On the uh, on the uh, the aborted snap, the fumbled snap, is that on him or was that on the new center? It looked like it, there was kind of a double clutch. He may have moved quickly. I, I didn't know who to blame for that one. You're not getting me kicked out of the center fraternity, Molly. That's on the quarterback. <laughs> it's always on the quarterback. <laughs> He's got to get that ball. He's got to secure it. The center's got 300-pound guys to block. You got to help us out when we're trying to run block people. You got your backup center in there. Going against what a lot of people may argue right now is a top three or four nose guard in the NFL. It's stopping the run. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Billings has been phenomenal. And, you know, like Cole Komet, they got him under contract at a really good price, a better price than Komet. And, uh, and I think that, that there have been some heady kind of signings uh, thus far for for uh, for the uh, the general manager, uh, Ryan Poles. So congratulations to him, too. I thought he had a good game. Yep. Hey, man, all of us, right? All of us. The, the analysts, Ryan Poles, three weeks, right? We got to enjoy this for three weeks. Ryan Poles, we talked about he came from Kansas City. He was a, a pro personnel guy there, and you can see that. And his T.J. Edwards signing, right? Great signing. T.J. Edwards is bringing a lot of value to the Chicago Bears, right? Jermaine Edmonds, uh, 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 Billings you talked about, Cole Komet, Montez Sweat. The, the scouting on the pro personnel side of the ball has been excellent, bringing these guys in. And, and all, everybody will bring up Chase Claypool and say, okay, what about – well, there, there was a mistake. But right now these other guys are playing well. Uh, we we got to keep seeing it. Uh, we don't want to go overboard with two games. I hate to say it, against the Lions. They are a good football team, but the Chicago Bears have played well against them. But that defense does look like what they're doing on film. You always ask yourself when you watch film, is can I believe what I'm seeing? And that's all we try to do. We try to be fair. Uh, people say you're always down on the Bears. No, I'm just, we're just telling you what we see on film. And one week I saw, man, look, this is the better football team playing good football. A lot of these guys are developing. Darnell Wright, you got Tevin Jenkins, Braxton Jones, you got guys now, DJ Moore, you got guys now that match up against the team you're going against. You knew yesterday if the, they could pull the Lions into man defense, that DJ Moore would be a problem covering. 
And all of a sudden, on the first drive of the second half, he has touched the ball four times. One run, three catches, one-on-one. -on -one. He can beat those DBs pretty easily. And then when you think about Montez Sweat, guys, he wasn't getting pressure against anybody yesterday, right? He was getting pressure against Panay Sewell, which we all will agree, besides Lane Johnson, maybe the second-best right tackle in the NFL. Great stuff, Olin. Thank you. Thanks, Olin. Appreciate it, guys. That is Olin Cruz.